In this video, I will explain how to design a program with a focus on algorithms. So previously, we learned that um, there's an input processing and output that occurs in computers. We mentioned that E uh, input is coming from keyboards, files, databases, web services, anything that provides input. An output be, could be anything on the screen or anything that's being recorded in files and databases. And in the middle is where the processes happen. In mass, processes could refer into some sort of computation. Let's say our input is 2 plus 3. And uh, 2 and 3 and our process is addition. The output of that process is going to be 5. It could be a conditional execution checking a condition and performing different tasks depending on the condition being true or not or it could be a repetition format so doing a certain task over and over again for a certain amount of time or certain number of repetitions now the key that connects input to output is what's known as algorithm an algorithm is essentially a set of step-by-step -step instructions that detail a process or computation and it's a set of logical well-defined rules or procedures for solving a problem or completing a task that we are intending to do algorithms are used in a wide range of fields including mathematics computer science engineering and data analysis and they will help us efficiently and accurately solve problems and complete tasks. Let's go over some examples to see how this works. Let's just start with a simple example. Imagine we want to boil a water on stove. So if that's our task, a set up of steps that starts with pouring a desired amount of water into a pot will be the sequence of logical steps to boil the water. So first pour the water, uh, we've pour the water into a pot, then put the pot on the stove and turn the burner high and then which, uh, we look for certain cues that tell us either seeing bubbles or steam uh, rising that will tell us the water is already boiling. And if we want to do, let's say we want to pour some tea, we pour that in a cup in order to prepare our tea. So in this simple example, we can see that algorithm essentially is the sequence of logical steps. Let's think about a slightly more complicated problem. Imagine we want to match socks that came out of laundry for a family of five or six individuals. So we have many socks and our goal is to go through the pile of unmatched socks and be able to put socks into the category um, and fold them together when they're matching. One approach could be to simply pick a sock and see if there's a match in the pile. And if we see a match, we pair it and put it on the side. And if we don't see a match, we also put it in a different pile that's called unmatched piles. And we go through this process until all of our socks are organized. In comparison, another approach would be to pick a sock and put it on one side, pick the second sock and see if it matches the first one. If it matches, we can pair it. Otherwise, we put it in a line of unmatched socks and we're just lumping it with the socks that have the same color or size. We can also use a different approach. First, we can, let's say, sort all the socks by color and create a pile based on colors. And then we can go through each um, color and either match them or we can also still sort them by size in each color. And then we go through the process until all the socks are matched and we can put them in the container. And if there's any unmatched socks, we can keep them in a separate container. Now, as you can see, there are slight differences between these algorithms. The first one might be very time consuming. The third one might be the fastest one. First, we sort them by either color or size, and then we use that as our guideline to 
put the socks together faster. Let's go through a third example. Imagine we are looking for Michael Smith in our, the old manual phone books, the old school way. And imagine that this phone book doesn't have any guide, so we don't know where the letters um, are. We know that it's sorted based on, let's say, last name, but we don't know where the letters start. One possible approach is to start flipping through the book one page at a time until we find Michael Smith. Let's say if Michael Smith is on page 550, it will take us 550 flipping in order to get to the point where we want. The second approach would be to flip two pages at a time. So if we do this, we might be able to get to the page 550 quite a bit faster. Maybe half, it would take half the time to get to 550. So we can look and see if until we either find Michael Smith or we see that we pass Michael Smith and then we can go backward. So the second approach is more efficient than the first approach. The third approach that I can think of is to look at the phone book in the middle and decide if Michael Smith would be on the left half or the right half of the book and let's say if it's on the right half we can throw the left part away completely um, removing half of our problem and we can do this process uh, splitting and seeing if it's on the left or right of that split until we get to the point so let's say if our book is a thousand pages we can get to any name by flipping 10 times only. Once we divide it, 2 by the power of 10 is going to come out to 1024. So if we are using this approach, we see that this is now quite a bit faster. So by only 10 flipping, we should be able to process an over 1,000 pages of phone book. This is also known as a binary search algorithm. It's a known algorithm in this field. So efficiency of the algorithm is something that we want to always think about. So when we say algorithm, not only it's a sequence of steps that give us accurate solution, but also we always strive for efficiency. So the first solution is pr quite linear. The second solution is linear, but it takes less time. But now we see that the last solution that we mentioned is quite a bit faster. So some algorithms can help us reduce the amount that it takes for computing quite a bit. And we always strive for this. So if we go back to a formal definition, algorithm is a set of step-by-step -step instructions that detail a process or computation or a logical, well-defined set of rules and procedures that efficiently and accurately help us solve a problem or complete a task. Now there are different ways that we can put together an algorithm. One would be using a natural language that in the same way that I discussed these few examples. It could be in form of a pseudocode, which I will talk about briefly in the following, or it could be in form of a programming language. And it's important to know that algorithm is independent of the language that's being used to write the code. So once we have an algorithm, it could be written in Java or Python. The algorithm will stay still the same. Here is a link where you can get some more information about the algorithm. But what is a pseudocode? So pseudocode, we know about algorithm in normal language. Pseudocode is a type of informal, high-level description of the structure of an algorithm. And pseudocode in general is written in a combination of natural language and programming language. So it's uh, slightly closer to the code, although it is not a code. And it used to describe an algorithm in a way that is easy for, to understand for developers particularly. So it can help them develop the programming, uh, the code using the programming language in mind, but by itself, it's now meant to be compiled or executed.
let's go through some examples to see what pseudocode is. Imagine we want to calculate employees pay so we can write down a sequence of steps first input the user um, the hours that's been the use uh, an employee have worked input the hourly pay rate calculate the gross pay based on hours multiplied by the pay rate and display the gross rate so let's say an employee has worked for 100 hours the hourly rate will be 18 100 times 18, the gross pay is going to be 1800. 1800 is going to be displayed. So we see that this is still natural language, but it's quite closer to the way a code can be written. For instance, display is print. Input is going to be a value we receive. So input is actually a method in Python. It's a function. And calculate. So these are the processes that are being done. Let's see another example. We want to check if a number or a value is odd or even. What we do is that first we receive a number. Second, we divide that number by two and we see if the rema remainder, the remainder is not equal to zero, then the number is odd. And if the condition is true, we go to step four and five, which says, if the condition step 3 is and in that case in a, if a step 2 is valid we print the number is odd we display the number is odd if the other condition the reverse condition is correct or this one is false then the number is even and we display the number is even so here we follow a sequence of steps we can show it also in form of a flow chart I have a video uh, that's recorded about flowcharts that's coming. So a number, enter a number, check the modulo, if C, if it's equal to zero, the number is even, and if it's not, you can print that the number is odd, and then finish the program. Again, this is independent of the programming language that we need to write. Now, the importance of pseudocode is that as you guys can see let's say this is a, this is the example of michael smith looking uh, for michael smith's phone number in the in the phone book so now if we look at some elements we see that there are some verbs pick up the phone book open the middle look at the page call mike open in the middle so all of these are example of functions in the python code okay so this is the pseudocode for that uh, that splitting algorithm the binary search. We also see some conditions. If Smith is on the page, call Mike. Otherwise, look earlier in the book. Otherwise, look later in the book. And then go back to some steps. So we're checking some conditions. Condition one, and then there are alternative situations to that. We also see some Boolean expressions. Boolean expressions are when we're checking for a condition and the output of the condition being true or false. If the Smith is on the page, the output could be true or false. If the Smith is earlier in the book, it could be true or false. And also there are some loops. Go back to line three. So look at the page. Look at line three. So these are example of loops. So a combination of functions, Boolean expressions, different types of control structures is what will help us write a program and these are considered the building blocks of this program. So depending on uh, depend on depending on the combination of each of these uh, components, we can come up with different codes. We're gonna explore each of these different building blocks um, in this course and um, next set of videos.